Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com, and thanks, as always, for tuning in. We'll continue this morning where we left off in the booklet entitled The Tragic Aftermath of Futurism. We're talking now at this time about the false hope that is called the rapture. The false hope. Listen, we're going to be taken out of this world at the resurrection, at the resurrection of the righteous. And that will be at the time of the visible return of our Lord Jesus Christ. There won't be a secret rapture. The Bible simply doesn't permit it. You can't find a secret rapture in the Bible unless you twist and turn the Scriptures. The teaching of the Scriptures is plain. And as we concluded yesterday, with Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 to 42. Here's what the Scripture says. Regarding the, the return of Jesus Christ, it says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. Took them all away. Who is them? The wicked. And, he's, and further it says, So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Watch, therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Okay? First of all, we are not to know when he is coming. We shall not know the day or the hour although the saints will not be taken by surprise. They will be expecting his return. But he is coming to destroy the wicked. This is evidence from further scripture. But the, but the author says the phrase, quote, the one shall be taken and the other left, unquote, has been widely used to mean that the saints are the ones who are taken in the rapture, and the wicked are left behind to endure the horrors of the so-called great tribulation of seven-year period of time. Okay? That's not at all what the Scripture tell, tells us. He says, when any elementary Bible student reads the text concerning the days of Noah in verses 37 through 39, it is plainly evident which ones are taken. It's not the righteous ones, Noah and his family, that were taken away in the flood. It was the wicked. For sure, Jesus Christ is indeed coming again. And when he returns, it's not the righteous that he's going to remove, but the wicked. Our Lord's lessons of the removal of the wicked first is, the very, is very evident in the parable of the wheat and the tares found in Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30 and 36 through 43. Jesus said that during the harvest at the end of the age, the angels shall first gather the tares out of his kingdom and burn them. Then the righteous shall shine forth in the kingdom of their father. Paul the Apostle wrote to Thessal the Thessal the easy for me to say, the Thessalonian saints, and set the record straight. Okay? Who, who shall correct us? Let the Apostle Paul correct us when he said in Second Thessalonians chapter one, verse seven through ten, quote, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels 
in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all of them that believe in that day. That's what it says in the Bible. Never mind what they say from the pulpits of the churches. The Scripture is our instruction. And if one were to teach contrary to the plain English teaching of the Scripture, he should be chastised and admonished. All right? Again, Paul admonishes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, quote, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. We are not appointed to the wrath that he will exercise when he returns visibly at his coming. That is the wrath of Almighty God. And that will be meted out to the wicked. Right? Now, how can the saints inherit the earth if they're taken out of it? The, the Scriptures won't permit a secret rapture. The Scriptures are consistent. Christ is coming to destroy the wicked and to establish his kingdom. Daniel even prophesied it. The metal man image, the head of gold, the shoulders and arms of silver, the thighs of bronze, the legs of iron, and the feet and toes of iron and miry, miry clay. And then the stone which was cut out of the mountain without hands strikes that image in the feet and grinds it to powder and it blows away with the wind. Now those are the four kingdoms, the four Gentile kingdoms that have ruled the world since the Babylonian Empire. The Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Grecian, and the Roman. All of it will be destroyed when Christ returns. And it will blow away with the wind as though it were ground to powder. That's the destruction of the wicked. Only then will the earth made fit, will the earth be made fit for the reign of Christ together with his saints. There's no secret rapture. Now I know, having been a futurist for the lion's share of my life, I look forward so much to the rapture. Lord, let me live until the rapture so I can experience the rapture for myself. What a false hope that was. What a deceitful, false hope that was. And... I have later discovered that it's simply a twisting and turning of the Scriptures, a false hope that is attached to another false prophecy. That is the future 70th week of Daniel. It all goes together. They're attached. You'll never hear taught the, sev the future 70th week of Daniel without the rapture being taught. And because the rapture is such a sweet concept, false though it is, it makes believing futurism very, very difficult to refute. Okay? People believe what they want to believe. And if they can attach this sweet-tasting rapture to this bitter lie called futurism, it just makes futurism all that much more difficult to unlearn. 
I've said many times to many different people, and I've even said here on the air, it's difficult enough to take new information and to learn it, okay? But it's even more difficult to unlearn a lifetime of false indoctrination and to receive the simple, scriptural, biblical, and prophetic truth. I have one particular listener who's become a dear friend of mine, a brother in Christ. He's a new Christian, and he's fortunate enough not to have ever been indoctrinated by the church and the false apostles and false priests, the false pastors behind the pulpits. He never learned futurism. He never learned about the rapture. He was never told any of these lies. And now he has a chance to read the scriptures all for himself, the plain English out of the scriptures, and believe it the way it is written not the way it is preached. And he will not be deceived. I hate to say that I'm envious, but I am. He's got a better chance than I ever had to understand the truth. He's never set foot in a church, and I advise him never to set foot in a church but to just simply read the Scriptures and ask for God's guidance and teaching through the Holy Spirit. And uh, I'm blessed to have His fellowship. Now, the author says, I once asked a professor of dispensational futurism for proof of the pre-tribulation rapture. The professor was a genuine born-again believer, highly educated with more than just one doctorate degree and very qualified in his field of study. He was setting forth, as they all do, the party line of the pre-tribulation rapture. My question was, quote, Doctor, what concrete biblical evidence is there for believing that the Christians will be raptured away before the tribulation to avoid the wrath of God that is poured out during that time, unquote, with a puzzled look on his face and contemplating a minute concerning his answer, he said, quote, the only real evidence I can think of is, quote, God hath not appointed us to wrath, unquote. Now somebody please tell me how God hath not appointed us to wrath. Is any kind of argument in support of a rapture? It's as flimsy as tissue. It's no argument to prove a rapture. God hath not indeed appointed us to wrath. His wrath is appointed unto the wicked and they will be destroyed. It says nothing about a rapture. Ever since that day, the author says, I've wondered how does that apply to the thousands of first century saints who became martyrs to whom that admonition was written. How does that fit with the 60 million Christians martyred under the heavy hand of papal Rome? the multiplied thousands of saints who were murdered under the dictates of Joseph Stalin, or the untold numbers of believers who died without mercy during the communist takeover of China in 1948. Several years ago, an interview with Corey Ten Boom was recorded where she stated that during World War II, when Northern Europe was being overrun by invading military forces and Christians brutalized, Many Christians ran to their pastors and asked them, Where's the rapture? The pastors had no answer. And the saints had been living with a false hope. Do you know where that false hope got to start? We've already talked about it. 
got to start with the Jesuits. Before the Jesuits, the rapture was never heard of in the world. Do you realize that? Up until the time of 1560 or thereabouts, the word rapture had never been heard. The concept had never been heard. And it had never been believed. Of course, Christians understood from the Scripture that there would be a resurrection. For the saints, both dead and living, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, would be changed. That this, in, that this corruptible body would become incorruptible. And this mortal body would become immortal. And we would be lifted up to as high as the clouds, the Scripture says. That's what the Scripture says. That was the hope, the blessed hope, the resurrection. This is the hope that the Sadducees rejected. They did not believe in the resurrection. But we believe in the resurrection because the Bible teaches it. Jesus taught it. But Jesus never taught about a rapture. The Scriptures don't teach about a rapture. The pastors do. But we don't believe it. The Bible's our instruction. Not wolves in sheep's clothing. Now the author continues, he says, when these facts are pointed out to a rapturous teacher, their immediate rebuttal is, quote, well that means Christians sometimes suffer the wrath of man, but not the wrath of God, and the tribulation is God's wrath and not man's, unquote. Yet this same rapture teachers tell us that during the tribulation the Antichrist will have complete control and kill those who, quote, have the testimony of Jesus Christ, unquote. But what about the souls under the altar crying for vengeance in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 through 11? Who are they? My regular listeners know. Those, the souls of the dead saints in that image painted for us in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 through 11, are the souls of all the righteous dead who have been slain by the papacy through all the inquisitions and persecutions, by the popes, and by the kings of Europe over which he ruled. Those are the saints. Those are the ones who were slain and yet not regarded. Those are the ones who history has forgotten. Those are the ones that we need to remember. The tribulation for the saints began at the rise of the papacy. The papacy came to power right after that which was restraining his rise to power was taken out of the way the Caesars of the Roman Empire. There's no seven years of great tribulation. There's the tribulation and persecution of the saints by the Antichrist of the Bible, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn, the papacy, the beast. Seven years of great tribulation? Rapture? Where was the rapture for the untold hundreds of millions of Christians who have died at the hands of the papacy? Why didn't God rapture them out? Are we so much better than they that we should be raptured out while they had suffer the insufferable tortures of the papacy? Is God a respect persons? There's not going to be a rapture. The Bible doesn't teach it. Logic won't permit it. And we continue to suffer with the saints, God, 
and we will continue to suffer at the hands of the papacy until Christ returns to destroy the wicked. Now what about saints, says the author, which came out of the great tribulation? In Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 through 17. Surely they endured the wrath of man during that time when the pre-tribulation rapturists declare that this will be the time of the wrath of God. Under close scrutiny of logic and the searchlight of scriptures, the pre-tribulation rapture theory and all of its props simply are washed away like a sand castle during high tide. Let me read it again. Let it sink in. The author asked the question, what about the saint, quote, which came out of the great tribulation, unquote, in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 through 17. Listen, how could they come out of the great tribulation unless they lived through it? Good question, isn't it? Why don't you ask the pre-tribulation rapture pastor about that passage and see what he says? The author again asked, what about the saints, quote, which came out of the great tribulation, unquote, in Revelation 7, verses 9 through 17? Surely they endured the wrath of man, that is, the man of sin, during the time when the pre-tribulation rapturists declare that this will be a time of the wrath of God. Under close scrutiny of logic and the searchlight of scriptures, the pre-tribulation rapture theory and all of its props simply are washed away like sand of a sand castle during high tide. Here's what the scripture really teaches. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. Quote, But I would not have you to be ache, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We'll hear what the what the uh, author has to say about this passage when we return from the break. My pleasure, privilege, and blessing to be here with you this morning. This is Inquisition Up. Stay tuned. We'll be back right after the break. First on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. 
If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Gold and silver is tremendously undervalued. Global demand vastly exceeds mine supply by more than 60% annually. There is little in the financial world more certain than a coming explosion in the prices of gold and silver. The U.S. dollar continues to lose value and respect as the world's reserve currency. Our nation faces challenges on many fronts, and a day doesn't pass without another economist bringing forth warnings of impending economic calamity. There has never been a better time than right now to acquire physical gold and silver. Discount Gold and Silver Trading was founded on the principles of truth and honesty. We believe in providing a quality product, quality service, and most importantly, competitive pricing. We provide all forms of precious metals, including American gold, silver, platinum, and rare investment and circulated coins. Silver bars, rounds, and 90% silver bags are on hand for the silver investor. Gold self-directed IRAs are available. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, that's 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. And if you'd like to keep Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio, please support First Amendment Radio. There's also now newly formed a tab where you can click on to contribute directly to Inquisition Update. And for those who have, I greatly appreciate it. But I covet more than your gifts. I covet your prayers. And uh, please say a prayer for me. And if you'd like to contact me, as many have lately, interestingly, you may email me. My my uh, email address is tom at cwaves.us. Check out the website, inquisitionupdate.org. Now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 and 17. Again, I read, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Unquote. Now before we read the author, I would like to weigh in on this myself. First of all, Paul does not want any of the saints to be ignorant. He wants them all to be knowledgeable about those who are asleep, those who have died in Christ. The saints. Now, if we believe a lie about those saints, then we remain ignorant, right? Because to be knowledgeable is to know the truth. To believe a lie is not knowledge at all, is it? So Paul's plainly telling you 
I'm going to tell you the truth about the dead in Christ. Despite what anybody else tells you, here is the truth. This is by the word of the Lord. You can trust this, what I'm about to tell you. Now, concerning the dead in Christ, we are not to be sorrowful as those who have no hope. And who are those, those who have no hope? those who believe lies concerning the dead in Christ. Okay? They're just like the Sadducees who did not believe in the resurrection. What they believed in, I don't know, but they denied the resurrection. Maybe they believed in something else like they do today. A rapture. But that's not knowledge. That's ignorance. That's lies. Okay? Our hope is not in a lie. Our hope is in the truth. The truth is the resurrection. The rapture is a lie. And if you believe a lie then you have no hope. Because the lie is no hope at all. All right? Now, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. You can trust this. This is faithful and true. This is by the word of the Lord. And here it is, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. In other words, Christ is not coming for those only who are alive at his coming. He's coming for all the saints, all who have died throughout history in Christ many of whom were killed by the papacy. And they were killed because they told, they believed and taught that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. They were historicists in their belief. They were anti-papists. Okay? They denounced the papacy as the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn, the beast. Okay, he's all of that and a bag of chips. That's why they died. And that's for whom Christ, they are the ones for whom Christ is returning. And he will take them up out of their graves. And I believe the righteous living at that time will see those graves opened. All right? For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. Listen. Christ's visible return will not be silent. It will not be secret. It will not be invisible. The whole earth will shake when he comes. And then the dead in Christ, who believe in the resurrection, who believe in Christ, who trust God and believe what he says, those who are knowledgeable and not ignorant, those who have believed the truth and not a lie, the dead in Christ shall raise first. The blessed hope, the resurrection, they shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Do you see what the rapture does to you? It's ignorance. It's a lie. Paul wants you to believe in the resurrection. 
the preachers want you to believe in a rapture, a secret, silent rapture, a two-stage coming of the Lord, once that's secret. No trumpet, no voice of the archangel, a secret rapture. At the last trump, you have to ask yourself, but the Bible says the last trump. How many last trumps are there? Is there the last trump for the rapture and a last trump for the resurrection? That would be two last trumps, wouldn't there? Wouldn't it? Is God silly? <laughs> Does God not know what he's saying? The last trump only blows once, doesn't it? Common sense. But the world loves ignorance. The world loves carefully devised fables. With the same subtlety with which Satan deceived Adam and Eve in the garden. Flattery. That's what the rapture is. Flattery. And you should, be re you should reject it. The author says, from this and other scripture passages, it is evident in the Bible that it teaches that Jesus is indeed coming again, and when he descends, he comes to remain on earth and remove out of his kingdom that which offends and works iniquity. Matthew chapter 13, verse 41. The angel Gabriel told Mary that her son Jesus shall be given the throne of his father David. That was an earthly throne, wasn't it? And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. Luke chapter 1, verse 31 to 33. This definitely sounds like he will be reigning here on earth forever, doesn't it? Even Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Listen to what they prayed. Quote, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. In earth as it is in heaven. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 and, 9 and 10. Paul the apostle wrote the words of comforting expectation to Titus when he said, quote, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, unquote. Titus 2, verse 13. When Paul wrote to the saints at Thessalonica, he was addressing one of the major concerns. That was the state of the righteous dead. He then assures the living saints that their Christian loved ones will not be forgotten by the Lord when he comes again. Their bodies will indeed be resurrected, just as he stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 15-57. The apostle declares that when Jesus returns, he will bring the spirits of all the sleeping saints with him. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15 through 17, he reassures the hope of the living saints by saying that, number one, the resurrection of the living saints will not prevent... The word prevent here is an old English word that literally means precede okay the resurrection of the living saints will not precede or take place before the resurrection of the sleeping saints the dead saints number two the lord himself shall descend from heaven with a very loud arrival announcement a shout the voice of the archangel and the trump of god there will be nothing secret or quiet about his return. The Second Thessalonians chapter one, verse seven and eight, and Matthew chapter twenty-four, verse thirty-one. There, where in the Bible is the quote-unquote secret rapture that is so famously and widely and universally taught from the pulpits of the churches today? Where is the secret rapture mentioned in this verse? where family members will be will quietly disappear without notice. Nowhere is it to be found. Anywhere in the Scripture. Number three. 
Then the bodies of the living saints at Jesus' return shall be changed. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 through 54, into an incorruptible body, and they shall possess a glorified body just like unto the Lord's glorious body. That's right. We shall see Him as He is. The Bible plainly tells us up until that point, no one has seen God at any time. Why? To, be, to behold Him, you must be like Him. Otherwise, you'll be consumed by the brightness of His coming. We have an example in the Bible of how Moses ascended the mountain to receive the law from God. And he did not see any likeness of God whatsoever. It's plain from the Scripture, you saw no image or likeness of me. All right? Do not make unto you any graven image or anything of anything that is in the heaven above or the earth beneath. Okay? Again, he said, you saw no likeness of me at all. But even then, Moses, it is recorded, peered through a cleft or a crack in the rock with God's hand placed over it. He was only allowed to see the hinder parts. And yet, even with that, when Moses descended the mountain, his face shone like the sun. There's something really, really powerful about looking upon the all-holy and glorified God. You cannot behold him in your flesh and survive. Moses came down off the mountain glowing so brightly they had to put a bag over his head. It's a terrible day when Christ returns. You ever shine a magnifying glass on a bright, sunshiny day on something, goes up in smoke, doesn't it? I believe the Scripture teaches that that's what it'll be like when Christ returns. Paul said, we don't know what we shall be, but we know this, that we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And that's why the Bible confirms that we will be transformed in the moment in a twinkling of an eye. Just that quick. Because if you to behold the glorified Christ any longer than the twinkling of an eye, you'd go up in smoke. So we will no longer in an instant and a twinkling of an eye be made of flammable flesh. We will be changed. We will receive immortal bodies, incorruptible bodies just like His. That's the only way we could lay our eyes upon Him and live to tell about it. But what about the wicked? The Bible says that they will raise not again for a thousand years. So what happens? They die at Christ's second coming, and they lie in the grave without hope until the second resurrection, the resurrection of the wicked. All right? The Bible plainly teaches this. Again, number three, then the bodies of the living saints at at Jesus coming shall be changed 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 51 through 54 into incorruptible bodies and they shall possess glorified bodies just like the Lord's somebody tells you Christ has returned all you have to do is look down and pinch your flesh if it is still the same flesh that you wear today you can call that man a liar. Christ has not returned. It's just as simple as that. 
When one tells you, lo, he's in the desert, lo, he's in the tabernacle, believe it not. If you're still in your same flesh that you wear today, believe it not. He is a liar. Now, when this phony 70th week of Daniel is allowed to transpire because God holds the keys, when Satan and his minions and his Antichrist manage to fulfill their phony 70th week of Daniel, and, of course, the phony Antichrist signs a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews. And once he's done out of the way, and the Pope rides into Jerusalem on the colt, the foal of an ass, and declares himself to be the vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on earth, that every man, woman, and child on the planet should worship him, the whole world will believe that this is Christ. They're being trained every day for that eventuality. All of the futurist teachings you hear from the papacy are preparing you for that day. But the easiest way to know whether the Pope is God's vicar on the earth is to simply look down and see if you're still in your flesh. If you can look upon his flesh and live to tell about it, he is not the Savior. He is not the Christ. It's just as simple as that. Will you be deceived? Get out of the churches. Satan has found the way to deceive God's people, and that is to put his minions behind every pulpit in this country and the world. False hope. A false Christ. A false antichrist. That's what they're preparing you for. Just read the scriptures. Number four. This latter group of living saints shall be caught up or removed from their present state of their present state of being to join the former group of sleeping saints. The Lord Jesus is not returning alone. Jude says that, quote, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Jude 14. This vast company of saints is what, comp what comprises the, quote, unquote, clouds of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. The living saints shall join this vast cloud of witnesses. See Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, while meeting the Lord in the air. The writer of Hebrews clearly applies the clouds of the witnesses to the people that he listed in chapter 11. In the air denotes the location of the state of the elevated and spiritual union with the sleeping saints and with the Lord Jesus. This scriptural passage, which is used as the main stronghold of the rapturists, says absolutely nothing about flying away to another planet called heaven. If there is a rapture to any degree at all, the saints will only go up as far as the air extends. Air is the elastic and invisible mixture of several gases, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen, that surrounds the Earth. This is the atmosphere of space above the Earth's surface. How far up from Earth's surface does the air extend? Then that would be the extent of this distance to, of travel. It would be less than seven miles. So what do they teach from from the pulpits of the churches, that we all go to heaven. Is that what the Scripture teaches? No. The writer Jude also gives us the purpose for which the Lord returns. He says, quote, to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them 
of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Unquote. Jude chapter 15. Sounds like he's coming to destroy the wicked. To take them out of the world so that we can have it. Heirs and joint heirs with Christ. The earth is mine and the fullness thereof, says the Scripture. The wicked will not inherit the earth. We do. Because the wicked will be taken out of it. The Bible teaches that there will be just one future glorious, visible, physical, and audible coming of the Lord. Number one, to execute judgment upon the ungodly. Number two, to be glorified in His saints. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 through 10. Does the Bible jibe at all with what they teach from the pulpits? No. False predictions. Among all the hype that is generated as a result of the prophetic theory of futurism are false predictions and vain speculations. The false predictions concerning the time of the rapture is nothing new. Men who claim they had special knowledge and insight into the future have mustered a devoted group of followers who surround themselves and, have, and now are felt safe by making outlandish predictions. In other words, they created their own audience. They created their own audience with carefully devised fables, taking the sheep, the Lord's sheep, to be followers of themselves, leading them out of truth and knowledge into ignorance and lies. Men, fleshly men, sinful, wicked, fallen men have led God's people astray. Let us forget the false hopes. Hold tight to that which is true. Let us abandon futurism, rapturism, and a phony, false, seven-year period of tribulation. I'll see you tomorrow. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, -S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossTheBorder.org.